we started a media reform coalition uh, just after the phone hacking crisis took off. And so not surprisingly, most of our work seems to have been dealing with and challenging the, ab the abuse of private media power. So taking on the Murdochs, taking on, uh, mostly it was just the millionaire, billionaire proprietors and the way in which they have utterly abused their power. The BBC didn't figure in the situation that much, but more and more, and in fact, all the time, the more they were attacked by Murdoch and uh, commercial interests, you know, your instinctive reaction is whose side am I on? Well, it can't be with the Murdochs. It can't be uh, with the uh, Rothermeers who run the mail. And yet, more and more, I found it quite difficult to have that kind of uncritical attitude towards the BBC until you get to the situation now where, and this is why I'm looking forward to the discussion, it feels quite difficult to defend the indefensible. So I welcome your suggestions about how to make sense of this. Would we, we you know, as Cam said, who would benefit from uh, a completely you know, eviscerated BBC? Would it be us? Probably not. But how do we actually negotiate this? You know, it's quite a difficult debate. Now, the one thing to say, we should not treat the BBC as one monolithic thing. There are, the BBC is a very complex organisation. You know, it does a lot of things. It delivers fantastic technology, which without, you know, the BBC, we may not have some of the big, important advances that we kind of take for granted. Um, it delivers great education. It does actually deliver some great programs. You may or may not agree with me every now and again. Um, you know, it is true that it doesn't have a billionaire owner, you know, that we are allegedly the people who are its shareholders. Is that, that's the kind of way in which it's put to us. You know, it was conceived precisely um, as distinct from a commercial setup. It was set up looking across the Atlantic and thinking that's not how we want to be. We don't want a commercial system. Um, and to a certain extent, that's something that we want to defend. I think many, everyone in this room, we want to defend public provision. We don't want to have a commercial health service, as we see in, in the US. We don't want a commercial media system. And so the BBC is set up in its co the conceptualization. The idea of the BBC is something that we would support very different to the way in which it is actually realised. The idea that it is now fully independent, I don't know how many people really believe it is independent from government. Tom's done a lot, got, you know, just read the book to find out the day-to-day -day ways in which its independence is and has always been compromised, both in the way in which, you know, the, the top of the BBC is regulated, the kind of informal interactions um, that, that take place. And we're always told that the BBC is a, a very important example of soft power. The BBC does a very good job for the British state. So it's a difficult situation. Um, and it's not surprising, if you have this understanding of the BBC, that when you look at its news operation, this is really the thing that I think disturbs a lot of us on the panel here. I don't really have a gripe with CBBS. I don't know who else is going to do it better. What I have the problem with is the job that that, um, that, that BBC News does in terms of just serving up a completely skewed, um, narrow uh, vision, neoliberal vision of the world. And then we have the research, we have the data on this. This isn't just random observations. We know that time and again, the BBC, at the core of its news operations, has been found to favour business voices over trade unions. As you said, Tory party statistics over uh, Labour ones regularly features pro-war voices over anti-war ones. It regularly, it, it, it's kind of wedded to this idea that politics is what happens just in, in Parliament and nowhere else. And that's why, despite their obligation to pursue as they are required to pursue it, due impartiality, um, we find that that is not what they live up to. So we had the media reform research just from early this year that looked at the coverage of Corbyn in the main news bulletins, the main ones which are watched by many millions of people, um, and we found that precisely twice as much airtime was given to the critics of Corbyn as to supporters of Corbyn. What was the reaction for the BBC? We were immediately dismissed as a, quote, vested interest group. But what was interesting is they didn't deny, they didn't actually refute any of our findings. And we heard from the inside, someone rang up anonymously and has followed it up, actually, 
um, uh, some producer, I think it's based in Manchester, who'd been told when they complained about the, the, what they saw as overt bias against Corbyn, um, that a senior Five Live producer said, well, it's all right, because we don't have to follow due impartiality if it's not an election. A leadership battle, not a problem. I mean, that's the kind of taken for granted assumptions. Now, the fact is that BBC executives aren't, they're not agents of the Tory government. They're not agents, um, uh, conscious agents of the state trying to screw us over. Um, and in fact, they're quite uncomfortable with some of the things that have been happening at the moment. They don't like it when the, when the government takes away something like 800 million pounds a year because the BBC now has to pay the cost of license, free licenses for the over 75s. Um, they don't like it when they are obliged to make cuts to services and, and channels. They don't like it when the government says, we're gonna appoint all the people on your board. They're not particularly comfortable with that. But actually, they're much less all right with a visible and radical challenge from the left. Then they, they're really uncomfortable with that. And to be honest, with someone like Corbyn and what Corbyn represents, they just, they don't get him. You will have noticed this. They don't understand how he could have, and they never asked the question how he did get to be elected. They just, you know, it's immediately, their, their job is to lead an attack, um, which is I think what we see and hear uh, uh, all, the, all the time now, precisely because he's someone who stands outside the Westminster consensus. He's not just one of the, you know, the, the usual suspects on whom they can rely, who share their assumptions. So they, they're confused in their response, and they're not alone in this response, is to demonize, to belittle, um, and so on. And so that's the regular. Um, uh, uh, now, is that a conspiracy? I don't think it's a conspiracy. I don't think there's any rooms where they meet to say, this is what we're going to do. I think there is a taken for granted assumption that Corbyn represents something which is not something um, that right thinking people will share. That's the kind of, it's, a, it's an internal culture. Um, and it's played out all the time. I mean, sometimes it's so visible. With, with Laura Koonsberg deliberately stage managing a resignation from Labour's shadow cabinet and boasting about how she managed to secure this live on TV. And it's pretty rare when you have someone who is as absolutely part of the BBC establishment as Sir Michael Lyons, who used to be a former chair of the BBC Trust, who said that, you know, who, who came out in public and said that the BBC had lost any sense of impartiality when it came to reporting Corbyn. These are his words. There have been some quite extraordinary attacks on the elected leader of the Labour Party. Quite extraordinary. I can understand why people are worried about whether some of the most senior editorial voices in the BBC have lost their impartiality on this. Now, and that's quite extraordinary in itself to hear someone in that position say, and, and he's basically saying, we've got to get this together because we don't want to expose ourselves. Um, and I don't think this, kind of, this bias is an accident, is a one-off. I think it's rooted in a system which is so intertwined with power. It's, so, it's staffed with, set up by elites. Why would you expect it to be anything else? So what's the solution? Have I got time to, yeah. a couple of yeah. minutes to go through? I mean, the solution is, someone said in, in a, a tweet or Facebook message, uh, in response to the panel, don't throw the baby out of the bathwater. They didn't expand on what they meant, but I suppose they meant here, you're going to have a meeting where you're just rubbishing the BBC and would we be better off without the BBC? So it's important we get the tone right. I mean, I want an independent public service content provider. I just want one that's free of state and corporate control. I do want one that's free of advertising. I want one that's free of domination by Oxbridge graduates. I want one that's free to challenge uh, rather than bow down before power. It's just the problem is that's not what the BBC is giving us. And I think we have to have sort of different scales. We want small, immediate reforms. I think, for example, over the appointments process now, the BBC is just about to be governed in a different way. It has a, the trust at the moment. It's now going to have a board. You'll be, some of you will be aware that the government tried just to stitch it all up and have government appointees. They backed down a bit. But actually, we don't want government anywhere near it. It's an outrage that government is going to select one single person on this board, let alone the chair, who of course will you know, change and skew the arguments that, that take place. That should be something we are outraged by. I'm trying to pump you up here. You know, we don't accept an independent public service broadcaster should the chair of that board should be someone who the government appoints. No, we shouldn't accept these things at, at all. We shouldn't accept that the, government, that the BBC has to pay for the over 75s. That was a policy decision. That's part of the government's welfare cuts. Why should the BBC be doing this? They should, if they were brave enough, they should have said, no, we're not doing this, and have a campaign. And, law, and that's how they would win respect and win a bit more loyalty. I'm opposed. I don't think they should do the government's dirty work. I'm opposed to the closure of any BBC 
um, services and channels um, just because they've been pressured to do so by commercial rivals. They should stand up to their commercial rivals and say, we don't want to do this. So I think there are all sorts of things that we can do. I mean, I would like to see an end to the license fee, to regressive tax. Why should rich people pay the same amount as someone who's on the dole? It doesn't make any sense. They should have it in, in lots of different, more progressive ways. I think they should drop their pretense towards imp due impartiality, um, you know, their policing of objectivity, because all it means is they're policing an incredibly narrow consensus of what is a P, you know, on immigration, on the reporting of the economy, that actually has all sorts of assumptions that are not shared by many millions of people. I think there should be a much more, you know, democratising the BBC. We want election to the, to the main bodies of the BBC. Staff reps should be there. Why not elect the Director General? One of, one of the, actually, Aaron, is that your idea? Was someone's, uh, someone's idea, very good one. Elect the Director General. Um, it also means you should complain. Complain a lot. I mean, you must be outraged by what you hear on, on the, and, and listen, when you listen to the news. You know, complain a lot. There are real human beings at the other end. And this is what Ken Loach was telling us. We had a rally in London the other week. And he was just standing up, you know, saying, make sure whenever you are outraged by something that someone at the BBC gets to hear this. So the next time they feature a climate change denier next to a proper scientist, complain. Every time they ignore a protest here, locally, complain. Every time they marginalise left-wing voices at the expense of right-wing right ones, complain. Now, obviously, you want to get angry, but you also need to get even, and that requires more fundamental changes. We need a change, of course, to the whole structure of media ownership in this country. Um, you know, we're in the Media Reform Coalition. We're, just try, we're, we're working with the Labour Shadow Cabinet now to try and introduce an amendment that's going out in the coming Digital Economy Bill um, to make sure that we tax um, the tax dodgers of Facebook and Google, that they should have, a, there should be a levy on their over, huge finances, a 1% levy on their revenues, and put that back, make sure they make a contribution to independent grassroots journalism. I'm not sure we should take it away from the BBC. I think there are plenty of other fat cats who should be forced to release some of the money to galvanize the kind, and, and to, to support the voices which sadly the BBC isn't doing. But the biggest thing with the BBC is just constant um, pressure from the outside. In a way, the simplest but most complicated thing to do is to make their ridiculous limited news gathering um, unrepresentative of what people in this country feel. In other words, when they get it wrong over the NHS, we should build the biggest campaign to, do, to, to kick out market forces from the NHS. You know, they're, they're absolutely outrageous reporting on foreign affairs and sort of pro war, favouring pro war voices. Build the biggest anti war movement, which makes it more difficult. For the, for, for the editorial line to hold. Um, but you know, that, that's part of what we should do, just to detach the BBC from the corridors of power it has lived for far too long. So build the movements which in turn will help to shape um, what the BBC think is worth reporting. So a whole series of small immediate reforms, but actually it is a much bigger debate about just making sure that there is a political climate which shapes the BBC as well as the government. Thank you very much.